I'm on. Am I on? Yes, I am. Um, good evening, everyone. My name's Ken. Um, if you are new or newish to WBC, if, you, if you're visiting for the infant dedication, let me add my welcome as well. It's great to have you here. Uh, it's great to have all of you here as we come to the end of our series in the book of 1 Samuel. Now, next week, uh, we'll be having our annual international service. Um, so make sure that you're here to experience the small taste of heaven that we have here at WBC with people from many nations all gathering together to worship Jesus. Uh, so that's a special event next Sunday. The following week, we'll be commencing a new series, which is called Conversations That Matter. Over eight weeks, we're going to think about how to respond to some tricky issues, uh, challenging things that we're not really necessarily sure how to answer, but how do we talk about them in such a way that these can lead into conversations about Jesus? Um, the new series handbooks are available today uh, for purchase. They're out on the welcome desk and even with this amazing cover, it looks great, uh, they're still just $2. Um, and so you can grab one of those to record your sermon notes in. Uh, you can get a head start on looking at what those topics are and how you would think about answering them. Um, and if you're not yet in a home group, um, then please let me chew your ear for 45 seconds to try and uh, convince you that it would be worth uh, giving that time, committing that time on a weekly basis to spending time together thinking about these things. But back now to 1 Samuel. We've spent more than two months, and if you haven't been with us, a uh, very, very quick summary. Um, I hope that you've found, it, those who have been here, I hope you've found it really valuable. We've been challenged by looking at this book from 3,000 years ago, that the dangers that Israel faced way back then remain our ongoing dangers. We must not allow ourselves to slip into the steps and the thinking of our neighbours around us who don't trust in Jesus. We need to be different because we know and love God. We've been encouraged through this account that in all the political and military scheming that characterises every era, that God is in complete control. And so we're not at the mercy of merely human leaders. How good it is to, to not have to try and control things that we can't. Um, and, and so it's, a, it's a, an encouraging book. We've also seen clearly portrayed that God has always had a plan for a humble, obedient king to come to our rescue, one who is in the line of David, and yet so much better than David. Jesus told his disciples after he'd risen that all of the Old Testament points to him, and, and week by week we've seen how Jesus is better in every way than even the best of the best. Our hope is that in the series, The Rise of the King, uh, we'll, we've seen that it's not ended until we meet the risen king. Now, as we all know, endings are very important. So we're going to push on together to finish to see what God has for us in these last two chapters of Samuel. Keep your Bibles open if you've got them. We're going to look at chapter 30 and 31. And as we do that, let me just open in prayer. Father God, we do thank you for the opportunity you've given us to meet together like this, to have your word in a language that we can understand, to have others that we can meet together with who want to think about these things and, and think together about what it means. Lord, we know if we trust in ourselves, if we rely on our own ability, uh, nothing will come of this. But we don't rely on ourselves. We want you to do your work in us by your spirit. And so we pray now that you would enable us to not only hear your word, but that you give us your grace to be enabled to respond to it appropriately. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Two little mice fell into a bucket of cream. The first mouse quickly gave up and drowned. The second mouse wouldn't quit. He struggled so hard that eventually he churned that cream into butter and crawled out of there. Gentlemen, as of this moment, I am that second mouse. Now, don't worry, my speech isn't motivated by a particularly trying week. I did manage to uh, inflict a black eye on myself at youth group on Friday night. We, we had a list of things that we were trying to collect. One of them was a, a, a photo of a purple car. Caught one out of the, what I thought was a purple car out of the corner of my eye. Kept walking along, looking back in the wrong direction. Caught a pole. 
uh, quite embarrassing. Um, I've been under the pump this week, uh, but that's not why I, I tell this story. This little made-up story vividly captures the opposite responses that can be made in difficult circumstances. When down and out, do you give up? Or when knocked down, do you get back up and fight again? Frank Abagnale's speech lines up with other positive thinking and self-help, like if you fall down, or if you fall off your horse, get back on again. If life gives you lemons, make lemonade. The motivation is to get us to try again, to give it another go, to never give up. And from one perspective, it is a great message. Tenacity is a great quality that, that we want our kids to develop in time. We ourselves are often in awe of athletes that push themselves to or seemingly even beyond the limit. We're amazed by those in stories that we hear on the news that survive against the odds because of their dogged determination. But seen from another angle, these different sayings and examples are often quoted with one purpose, to encourage self-reliance, which rather than something desirable, is something that the Bible warns us is a danger that we all need to flee from. In chapter 30 and 31, the final two chapters of 1 Samuel, we read of David and Saul's experience at war as God's anointed ones, which may not appear at first glance to be all that relatable to situations that we might find ourselves in. But there's an underlying principle in these accounts that applies to, I think, everyone who's sitting here. And so our question this evening is, in difficult circumstances, what is our hope? We'll answer that question by looking at three points. Trusting in God, which covers chapter 30. Trusting in ourself, chapter 31. And that sets us up to ask the final question, who are we trusting in? Trusting in God, trusting in ourselves, who are we trusting in? As has been the case since halfway through the book of 1 Samuel, in these last chapters we again have a contrast being set up between Saul and David. Both men find themselves in incredibly difficult circumstances. Back in chapter 27, because of Saul's unrelenting pursuit of David, David had run away from Saul and was hiding in enemy territory in Philistine country. While living there, he lies to the king, King Achish, about what he and his men are doing. Now, we could try to spin it to say that David is shrewdly getting rid of God's enemies from the promised land in obedience to a previous command. But it looks like, much more like, that in difficult circumstances, David has stopped trusting in God and has started trusting in himself again. So successful is the deceit perpetrated by David and his men, that in chapter 28, David is asked by King Achish to join him in his fight against Saul and, the, Philist and the, the, the Israelites. It is only by God's mercy and the, the doubt of the Philistine rulers in chapter 29 that David and his men are mercifully sent home from the battle. But while David's behaviour is questionable, Saul's behaviour is flat-out disobedient. Because Saul consistently refused to listen and obey God's word, God has stopped talking to Saul. Faced with the prospect of a war with the Philistines, in chapter 28, Saul calls Samuel up from the dead to ask for direction, an act of extreme desperation and defiance of God's ways. Samuel repeats the judgment that God has already handed down. Because Saul has repeatedly refused to obey God's word, God has rejected Saul, and all that remains is for Saul and his sons to die. In chapter 30, David and his men return to their temporary home in Philistine territory to find out that while they've been up at the battle, their homes have been attacked, their houses have been burnt to the ground, and all of their families and all their wealth have been taken as plunder. As a result, David's men lose hope 
battle-hardened warriors weep until they don't have the strength to weep anymore. David's failed military strategy is directly blamed for this disaster. And there's even talk of a lynch mob of, of killing David as revenge. Talk about out of the frying pan and into the fire. And so David struggled so hard that he churned that cream into butter. No, it doesn't say that at all. Rather, we read in verse 6, but David found strength in the Lord his God. David found strength in the Lord his God. Now, if we're not very careful here, we could see this as brave David, the giant killer, rediscovering his inner strength, getting back his mojo. This could be confused with Rocky getting back up off the canvas and and fighting when it shouldn't be possible to do. But that is not what's happening here in 1 Samuel. David doesn't find strength within himself. The strength he receives is from God. Between a rock and a hard place, David's response illustrates for us what trust in God actually looks like. Firstly, David doesn't presume to know what to do. Rather than coming up with a strategy and asking God to rubber stamp it, David comes humbly before God, waiting on his instructions. For him, that meant asking Abiathar the priest what they should do. And when told what to do, there is an immediate, unquestioning response. An unquestioning response of obedience. For us, this will mean letting go of our agenda. The outcomes that we might have concluded are best for our situation and genuinely allowing God to tell us what to do. Johnny Erickson is a a famous Christian that I think is still one of the best known examples of this. Breaking her neck in a diving accident, she initially prayed that God would heal her. Decades later, she expresses gratitude to God that he answered her prayers with a no in order to give her something better than she could have come up with herself. Now, she doesn't pretend that accepting God's answer was an easy process. To let go of what she thought was best was actually a prolonged and painful struggle. Her response is inspirational to me and to many, many others. But I think that David's trust here in 1 Samuel, his trust in God, challenges us even more. His response pushes us to ask, how can we get better at trusting God immediately and in all circumstances, at submitting to him, at holding our plans loosely so that that God doesn't have to pry our fingers off? Why is it often that it's not until we have the benefit of hindsight that we admit that God had a better plan than the one that we could come up with? Why are we so hesitant? to let the all-knowing good God tell us what to do. And even on those occasions when we do obey God, it's not always immediately obvious that we've made the right choice. When David obeys God's word, verse 9, the situation gets even more difficult. Like Gideon, when he had too many men back in the book of Judges, God reduces their number. Yet with just 400 men, verse 10 says, They continue the pursuit because they know that this is what God has told them to do. How can we be just as assured that we are doing as God has said rather than as we've concluded, as as we've made up? By chance, verse 11 seems to indicate they come across this exhausted Egyptian. It's absolutely fascinating how the author records the events taking place in one moment. David is explicitly calling upon God for direction, obeying instructions that are given to him through the priest. In the next, he's providing food for a famished slave in order to interrogate him. Should we conclude that David has given up trusting in God? Or is it better to see this discarded slave as the God-provided means by which God directs David's next step in obedience to his commands. I think that it demonstrates that trusting in God often means stepping out and maintaining a God-given direction. And as we do that, 
many of the individual steps require our thinking, our strategizing, our efforts. Our effort, if they come from the right motivation and are ongoingly submitted to God, don't indicate that we've stopped trusting in God. They are the proof that we do trust him. Our actions in and of themselves don't reveal whether we're trusting God or we're trusting ourselves. But our response to the outcome does reveal a lot about what we really think about them. Having caught up with the Amalekites who had raided their home, rescuing all of the family members and taking a huge amount of plunder, David rebukes some of his men who conclude that their greater efforts deserved greater rewards. Some of the men had slackened off. They were so tight, they had a rest by the river. Some had gone into battle and they thought, we should get more. Verse 23, David replied, No, my brothers, you must not do that with what the Lord has given us. He has protected us and delivered into our hands the raiding party that came against us. It's an incredible insight immediately on the back of a spectacular victory. Having just implemented his strategy, having used his strength to swing the sword, David acknowledges that success has been granted by God. If God hadn't have been in this, the best strategy, the, the best warriors in the world would have amounted to nothing. But even more than that, anticipating Jesus' parable in Matthew chapter 20, the workers, whether serving all day or only for the last hour, are all given a gracious reward. Some feel that it's unfair. But that shows that they've misunderstood the generosity of the one who has given them everything that they have. David gets it. God has given this victory. And the evidence that he really gets it is shown in his ongoing further response. Blessed with an abundance of plunder, rather than keeping it to line his own pockets, David responds with generosity. Saul takes what he desires from those that he rules over. David gives generously to his friends, to those who've gone up into battle with them, with him. It sounds almost like the perfect response. Is this the king that we've been waiting for? The king that was anticipated since the time of the judges when everyone did as he saw fit. Is David the king? who will trust in God and be blessed to be a blessing, the one who will bring and establish lasting peace. Well, unfortunately, at this point, we need to stop and ask, have we been looking at all of this from the wrong perspective? Many of you will have already seen this picture. Is it a six or is it a nine? Well, it depends on your perspective, doesn't it? And as we come to the end of 1 Samuel, we see that exactly the same events can be interpreted from two different perspectives. So let's reconsider David's stunning victory. We've already seen that it's presented as a success. But at the same time, the author notes in verse 17 that 400 young Amalekites have escaped on, on camels. Saul, in contrast, had let just one man go. It was the king, but God had condemned that as rebellion. Is this 400 times worse? And what is David doing with so many animals after the battle? The very thing that Samuel was rebuked, sorry, that Saul was rebuked by Samuel for. What's that lowing of cattle I can hear in my ears? We can even ask questions of David's motivation. In verses 26 to 31, is David returning stolen goods to fellow Israelites or is he sending bribes to make leaders favourably disposed to him in the future? Now, don't get me wrong. There is good things going on here in, these last, in this last chapter. But at the same time, subtle questions are being raised by the author. Is there already present in the moment of one of David's greatest victories the roots of a problem that will grow to undermine David's rule. Does David really trust in God? Or deep down, does David trust in David? 
Well, that brings us up to chapter 31, which was read for us earlier. And it is clearly a demonstration of our second point, trusting in ourselves and the consequences that follow. At exactly the same time, we need to understand that David is securing victory over the Amalekites. With God's help, Saul is being defeated by the Philistines all on his own. Saul's three sons, the princes who Israel believed would ensure ongoing security for Israel into the future, are all killed. Saul too is fatally wounded by an arrow. Saul realises that his situation is hopeless and like the mouth I spoke of at the beginning, Saul struggled so hard that eventually he churned that cream into butter and crawled out. No, Saul gave up. He knows that his end is near. Not because he's finally accepted God's word via Samuel, but because the cold, sharp pain of an arrow finally drives home the truth. And unlike David, in a desperate situation, for Saul, in his desperate situation, there is no turning to God, no finding strength in one greater than himself. Rather, he continues in his desperation to trust in himself, giving his final command as king an order to his armour bearer to finish him off. Saul's intention is to speed up an already outcome so that the enemy can't come and abuse this great king of Israel, mocking him in his weakened state. But like David, who had earlier been appointed one of Saul's armour bearers, this unnamed soldier is unwilling to raise his hand against the Lord's anointed. And so with biting irony, Saul, the king who disobeys God, is in his final act as king, disobeyed. Saul takes his own life, a tragic ending for one who had begun so well. The armour bearer does likewise, literally falling on his own sword. It's gory, it's graphic, and verse 6 summarises. So Saul and his three sons and his armour bearer and all his men died together that same day. Now, it's probably hyperbole. Not literally every single Israelite died. Or does this mean that Saul actually only had five or six men? What it does highlight is the main point, the contrast between David's comprehensive victory and Saul's comprehensive defeat. David trusts God, obeys God's word, and as a result, secures a great victory. Saul forsakes God disobeys his word, and the result is catastrophe. But there's still more bad news to come. Verse 8 tells us that it's not until the next day that Saul's body is found. Presumably the practice of the Philistines recorded here is to gather anything of value on the dead soldiers to finish off any wounded enemies that remain on the battlefield. But in Saul's case, the tallest man in Israel is beheaded. In 1 Samuel, this is the ending that had earlier come to the idol Dagon and to Goliath, the great tall warrior. Terrifyingly, it places Saul firmly in the category of enemy of God. And rejoicing in the victory, the Philistines literally proclaim the gospel. We've heard that word used already a number of times, the gospel, the good news. Military victories are where the word gospel originally comes from. The Philistines send the good news back home to Philistine territory so that all can celebrate the victory that was won for them over there. As he had feared while he was still alive, Saul is humiliated by his enemies in death. As the ark had been placed in front of Dagon way back in chapter 5, so Saul's armour is placed in the temple of the female equivalent, Ashtoreth. It's a statement by the Philistines saying, no, no, our leader's better than your leader. And it's not an unsurprising conclusion for the Philistines to come to. And yet, if we are careful readers, we know that what is really going on here is that God's judgment of Saul, proclaimed through the prophet Samuel, has been fulfilled. If the anointed one will not honour God, then he must die in dishonour. If Israel's king 
won't listen and humbly submit to God's word, he must be removed from his position. But is there yet another change of perspective in the final verses, the the final three verses of this chapter, of the whole book of 1 Samuel? Record the noble acts of the valiant men of Jabesh Gilead. Now, we've, we've, we've encountered these men 40 years earlier. Saul, in his first military act as a spirit empowered king, go to their rescue. And now, 40 years later, they repay the favour at much risk to their own lives. Humiliated by his enemies, Saul is shown honour by his own for the time when he had obeyed God, which is an incredibly positive thing. This is a nice thing to to recognise Saul's obedience to God early in his life. But again, from another perspective, in the terrible ending of a tragic death, it serves as a subtle reminder of Saul's great beginnings, and so actually raises the question, what if Saul had continued trusting in God? What if he'd only obeyed? If he'd continually used his spirit empowerment for the benefit of others rather than the benefit of himself? What could have been? But Saul didn't obey God. Saul trusted himself. And so Israel's first experiment with a human king has ended in disaster. Even the act of honouring Saul's faithfulness to God can be interpreted as a criticism of a lack, of the lack of ongoing faithfulness. The lesson shines brighter and brighter the closer we get to the end. Why would you trust in yourself when you can trust in the all-powerful God? And though we are hoping for better things with David, scarily there are already signs that he has weaknesses that may lead to more problems. While we initially thought that chapter 30 was positive, in hindsight, is it actually more of a warning, a statement that unless David gets rid of any self-reliance, commits himself to unquestioning obedience of God, that rather than being exalted, that even his reign could end in humiliation and dishonour. Now, if you are feeling a little perplexed that the author is playing games with us, thinking, come on, Ken, just come out and tell us what we're supposed to do. Well, if that's the case, then I think that the author has got us exactly where he wanted to get us to. In order to hit us with this final question, who are we trusting in? Who are we trusting in? The author has brilliantly shown how complicated real life is, demonstrating that trusting in God, easy to say, very difficult to actually do. And yet as God's people, down through the centuries reflected on 1 Samuel, the need to trust in God was the unmissable lesson that kept on coming through over and over. The first readers of 1 Samuel were most likely Israelites who got kicked out of the promised land for their ongoing disobedience of God's word. Exiled to Babylon, they would have been asking, how did we get here? Aren't we God's special people? Isn't the Almighty God the the one who rescued us from Egypt, the one who brought us into the promised land? Isn't he the God who's on our side? And the thoughtful answer that the author of 1 Samuel wants his readers to come to is for them to realise that they're asking the wrong question. It's not, is God on our side? They should be asking, are we on his? 1 Samuel has made it abundantly clear that God can defeat any enemy. He can do it solo. He can do it through a boy with a sling. He can do it with an army. It makes no difference to God. The issue is, will we align ourselves with the all-conquering God? Will we listen to him, doing things as he instructs? God is the only one capable of rescuing. And rescue only comes on his terms. So trust in God. When Saul did things God's ways, the rescue was complete. When David did things God's ways, the rescue was complete. And for Israel, stranded outside the promised land, under the power of a foreign nation in Babylon, the encouragement to them at that time was put your trust in God. 
if they will do things God's way, their rescue will be complete too. The prophet developed this message, proclaiming to Israel that God would bring about a second exodus, even better than the one from Egypt, if they would only turn from their self-reliance and wholeheartedly live God's way. The message was clear. Do not live like the nations or you will remain exiled among the nations. Trust in God. Live his ways. Centuries later, quite a number of Israelites had returned to the promised land and and as they read the book of 1 Samuel, they too were encouraged to put their trust in God. Though back home, their rescue had been incomplete. They remained under the oppressive power of Persia or Greece or Rome, depending on who was reading and when. And yet the message down through the centuries was exactly the same. God is the only one capable of rescue. And rescue only comes on his terms. So live according to his ways. Don't let your situation change your perspective of God. Let the truth about God change your perspective of your situation. Trust in God. And I think for us thousands of years later, the message remains exactly the same. Trust in God. God is still the only one capable of rescuing us and rescue still comes only on his terms. So live according to his ways. Which with the benefit of hindsight doesn't mean to simply try harder to keep all the rules. The Old Testament reveals that even the best are unable to keep all of God's standards. And so when Jesus comes and trusts his Father completely, obeying the law perfectly, he does what no one else was capable of doing, what no one else is capable of doing. We are so privileged to live in this time, on this side of the cross, to know that King Jesus wins the final victory. His victory is not simply winning a battle from which the enemy will come back sometime in the future and gain his revenge. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus wins the war, finally and forever. God's way is clarified for us to be acknowledging that we are incapable of perfect obedience or complete trust. Only Jesus can do that. And so God's way is to accept Jesus, perfect obedience, as the thing that makes us acceptable to God. God's way is for us to accept Jesus as the King. And so we've got to ask the question in our real life situations, are we trusting in him? Are we living his ways? It is often assumed that it's hardest to trust God when things are desperate. But I think that 1 Samuel proves that there's an even bigger danger. Saul first stopped listening to God when things were going well. It was good outcomes that led to his self-reliance, not hard times. So it's not just the dark valleys that are dangerous. Perhaps the mountaintop experiences are too, perhaps even more so. But I think that the hardest part of all of this is that in practice, it is actually quite tricky to trust in God. And rather than a simplistic how-to recipe, 1 Samuel shows us that trusting God is often experienced by us as a balancing act. Trust doesn't mean to passively wait, waiting for God to do everything for us. Because we trust in him, we act. And yet the exact same action can be either self-reliance or reliance on God. Sometimes God gives us an explicit direction. Other times, he expects us to use the wisdom that we've gained by experience. How do I know which kind of situation I find myself in? Or even more complicated, is is there a clear instruction to obey and at the same time I I need to apply my own thinking? When Christy and I first headed off to Thailand, we believed that it was clearly in alignment with God's word, lined up with God's heart for the nations, one of the things we're going to celebrate next week. But even then it still required concerted prayer, weighing up options, seeking advice, making choices based on limited information. It wasn't God's word or our careful planning. 
It was both together. And I think the same principle applies with all the big questions. What career? Where are we going to live? Who am I going to marry? But trusting in God in the small things is just as important. Do we actively seek God's way in all areas of life? Do we trust him in how we use our free time? what we watch on TV, where we go on holiday. As we trust and obey God in the small things, it will give us confidence to trust him in the big things too. Adding to the complexity, 1 Samuel shows that outcomes don't even necessarily reveal whether we've responded in obedience. It makes sense that if God approves of our actions, we'll see it in the fruit. And that is true in the long term. But it's probably a dangerous tool for us to use in the short term. Sometimes doing the very thing that we're supposed to do makes things much harder rather than easier. Will we continue to obey God even when God's ways come with a cost? Yet another issue is that getting it right once doesn't ensure that we'll keep on getting it right. What begins as reliance upon God can easily and unnoticeably drift into self-reliance. I think that this is one of the main points that the author of 1 Samuel wants to make, not just in these chapters, but in the whole book. Saul started off so well. And look at how bad, how, how terrible the ending is. And yet there doesn't appear to be a specific moment in which Saul concluded that, well, I think I can do things better than God can. Saul probably never made a conscious decision to turn his back on God, to rebel. And yet he allows his trust to drift over time. The author of the book of Hebrews in the New Testament picks up this idea and shows how we as Christians have have been given God's word even more clearly than those in Old Testament times had it. According to Hebrews chapter 1, 1 and 2, God spoke through the prophets it was clear but in these last days he has spoken even more clearly through his son it should be much harder for us to slip into Saul's mistake and yet despite having things made even clearer our constant danger is still to drift from trusting in Jesus to trusting in ourselves let's pray asking God that he will keep us all from such a fate Lord God, in the face of such a challenge, it would be easy to try and pull ourselves up by the bootstraps, to recommit to trying harder. And yet that undermines the very answer that you've given to us. There's no point in relying on ourselves. We need to trust in you. We thank you that even better than Saul and Samuel and David had it, we've had it demonstrated clearly before our eyes that you are, the capable saviour, the one who provides the rescue for us, the rescue that we couldn't achieve by ourselves. And so we ask that you would enable us to stop trusting in ourselves and trust in Jesus. Trust him in the small things and trust him in all the big things in our lives too. We pray that our lives would be lived for the risen king. We pray it in his name and for his glory.